<laughs> Punctuality. Okay, this meeting is being recorded. Hi, Hi. it's Jerry Roberts. <clears throat> Back with another edition of Newsmakers Journal of the Vaccine Year. It is Wednesday, July 28th. And today we're talking about the Santa Barbara mayor's race. And uh, we have invited all four of the candidates uh, to come on uh, whenever it's convenient for them this morning. Uh, and uh, three of them have said they'll weigh in, Randy Rouse, Deborah Schwartz, and James Joyce, the mayor herself, says she is unavailable. But we're talking specifically um, about the city administrator. Um, Paul Casey recently announced his retirement and uh, the council now has to find someone new. Uh, Randy, what do you think is the most important criteria uh, in seeking a new uh, administrator? Well, uh, thanks, Jerry. You know, I, I, I was in on the, the uh, with the council when we hired Paul Case in, uh, in a field of, I think we had six final candidates after a, a nationwide search. And uh, he was just another applicant at the time. Uh, and so, and then we've done also annual reviews and I participated in, in those reviews. I think they might use a consultant now back in those days, we were actually going out and interviewing people ourselves, like people on staff, uh, people that were peers out of the community. Um, and we got a nice 360 degree view of uh, whoever, whoever we were reviewing. So in Paul's case, I had done that a few times as well as with Jim Armstrong. I've also been around four, four different city administrators in my career in terms of uh, either being a business across the street and participating with them or being on committee chairs and whatnot. And so I've gotten to interact with a few Got to see the different styles, and I think I have a pretty good feel for what uh, what works and what what uh, may be problems. Right. So, uh, were I to lay out a series of criteria, I mean, the first thing you need is a very you need a confident executive. You need somebody who exudes the confidence uh, that they are in charge, the confidence that they are open to listening, and the confidence that they know how to run the organization. And of course, uh, whatever resumes they do have are, are going to be important. Um, I think there needs to be, a, they need to contain a vision for a structural functionality. Well, what I mean by that is the protocols in terms of the, uh, the org chart, who's, who does what and who, who, um, who is in charge of what. Most employees, and this relates to the business world as well, most employees really want to know what's expected of them. That's, that's number one in the hierarchy of priorities. So do we communicate successfully what's expected to our subordinates. So would this new person do that? I think that's a big, big criteria as well. All right. Let me, um, uh, let me just pause for one second, Randy, to welcome in uh, two other guests, uh, Deborah Schwartz, Planning Commissioner. Thanks for taking the time. And James Joyce, uh, uh, who is the founder and uh, uh, chief, I guess, CEO of Coffee with a Black Eye, a, a nonprofit group. And we are talking about the city administrator and what the criteria should be for uh, selecting the next one. All three of you uh, good people are, are running for mayor. The mayor herself said she was <clears throat> unavailable this morning uh, to speak with us. But uh, uh, <clears throat> let me go back to Randy, if I could. Uh, Randy, you were talking about your, um, your experience uh, in having been on the committee that hired Paul Casey, who is now leaving. Uh, I looked at the city charter this morning, and this really is a question for everyone. Uh, 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 section six about the city administrator. There's really no, not many criteria that's listed. It says he, which probably uh, needs to be updated a little bit, shall be 30 years old and have at least five years of experience as a city administrator or a deputy or something else. Um, but Randy, let me ask you this, because Santa Barbara is really a large, and, and I want everyone to jump in on this question, you know, a full service city. We got an airport, we got a harbor, we got a revenue water department, as well as, of course, police, fire, public works, parks, so on and so forth. Someone has to have five years of experience. It sounds like a very limited universe of candidates. Uh, what, what was your experience when you interviewed people previously about how many people really qualify. Well, you're, you're, you're right about that, Jerry. We interviewed a lot of people. Some people were from similar size agencies, but they weren't agencies that contained full service and this, that kind of diversity. 
So when you talk about a $400 million corporation, which you're really looking to have a CEO run, you also have to have somebody that uh, has at least some knowledge or background of a municipal airport, of a, of a, of a waterfront harbor. There's a lot of, of, of pieces that you don't necessarily have to have somebody that did all those things, but at least understand what they are, uh, how the different enterprise functions work, what it's like to work with the FAA and the Coastal Tidelands Trust and all those different kinds of agencies. So, and those are all great questions to ask about somebody's resume and background if they really have an understanding of those different aspects. All right, let me bring Deborah in. Um, uh, Deborah, as you know, uh, section 604 about the powers and duties of the administrator uh, say, uh, he, again, he shall be responsible to the city council for the proper administration of all affairs of the city. That's a big load of stuff. Uh, what's your uh, recommendation or what's most important? Is it a budget or disaster planning or economic development? What do you think? Well, it's all of the above, Jerry. Um, you've already pointed out that we're a full service city. And I think the traditional approach to recruiting a city administrator is really outdated. The city charter needs review for a whole host of reasons. But if we just go to uh, how the council has been conducting searches, uh, it does not meet contemporary need and it does not serve the city. Uh, beyond public sector experience, I am firmly of a mind that we need to look to other sectors. Uh, we need a chief executive officer, chief operating officer, who's not just from the public sector, inside government. Uh, and I think in a time of needing business savvy, relationships with the business sector, uh, innovation, track records, that's not going to come from a tried and true public sector recruiting. Um, so we can, can talk more about that, but um, we're at a critical crossroads. You know, I've spoken with you about this, like a once in a generation crossroads. And I think everything from the city administrator to the, the next mayor is on the line, which is one of the many reasons I'm running. Yeah, uh, and James Joyce, let me bring you in. Um, uh, one of the things, you know, Paul Casey just kind of said it was a good time to leave. It kind of surprised people, but I think one of the things that, uh, a lot of people point to was how challenging it is to deal with a district elected board of uh, or a city council for the first time. You've been in government, um, worked a, a, as a legislative aide in Sacramento, and uh, how important would you rank the uh, kind of political gene for a new administrator as opposed to a finance disaster, some of these other issues, and, and what do you think is the most important thing? No, I, I appreciate that, that, that question, Jerry, and, and good to see you on here, both Randy and Deborah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I'd kind of parse it a, a slightly different than that, Jerry. I, I parse it a little bit more on uh, a leader versus a boss, right? And, and, and essentially what we need at, at a city administrator level, the way it's kind of laid out, is that, that we need someone who's gonna, gonna really you know, be a, a leader in the mindset of allowing others within the city that are already good qualified you know, employees of the city, really bringing out the best of those employees. And, and, and you know, that really takes a special kind of leadership at, at the position of a city administrator. And I think that that's something that, that, that we need to be mindful of, of, of what is the, the tone and the leadership style uh, of the individual that we, we put in this position. And, and you know, I, I don't think that, that that necessarily has to just include candidates, you know, that, that, you know, from things outside of government. You know, I think it's good to include that, that diversity in the pool of candidates, but I think we've got some, some great qualified candidates within the city uh, who, 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 who may or may not have been able to, to, to really shine in their current positions. Uh, who are qualified to be able to do this. And, and, and there's individuals like that that we need to, to continue to encourage to, to build up within the city as well as bring in individuals from outside. All right, Randy, what about, what about that point within the city versus without? Because every time one of these positions comes open, we do a big, dun, 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 you know, we're doing a national search. Uh, and I can, I know from experience that parachuting into Santa Barbara and trying to take over a big organization that's you know an institution in the 
in the community is not easy. It's a quirky community. What do you what do you think on that point? Well, you know, first of all, I think the major problem is I think why the three of us are sitting here running these candidates right now is we all understand that the real change has to happen from the leadership on council. We're not, this is not a referendum on the job of city administrator. We need to hire one, and we need to know what the qualifications are. But we also need to take responsibility as a mayor and our council to, to develop policies that are, that, are, that are possible to do. And I think that we, we gave the current one an, kind of an impossible job. Regarding the public sector, private sector interface, as somebody who comes from the private sector and has done a lot of remote uh, business training, seminars, those kinds of things in management, what I realize is the public sector or the private sector isn't necessarily a genius conferring body all by itself. It's, it's, and if this is a job that is slightly different, having those kinds of chops, I think Deborah is correct. I think that diversity uh, would be a good thing. Um, but do I think that somebody could come in without government experience and step in and do this? I actually don't, because you are running a government organization. A government business is maddeningly, maddeningly is, is for so many people. Uh, they're not the same thing. They are two different animals. And uh, understanding some of the intimacies of how we work and, and work with our government agencies, as well as the legalities of working within a charter, are going to be really important. So I think we need to have that kind of experience from that kind of pool. Bringing that person to Santa Barbara, given our, you know, number one, our housing uh, expectations are gonna to be tough, but also the fact that uh, in terms of our public image right now, we look a little dysfunctional out there in the public. And, uh, oh, and that's, that's, gonna be a, that's gonna be an issue. Yeah, Jerry, Barbara, can, go ahead. Can, I, can I bring us back to a core issue kind of as almost to reset as a, a starting point? And that is um, what we should make of the city administrators precipitous or sudden resignation. For me, uh, it was not a surprise that he resigned, but the timing of his resignation uh, raises some very important questions that connect with leadership, that connect with, as was said in the front page of the Montecito Journal, culture matters. Yes, that was referring to Kate's school and the alleged sexual abuse, but culture matters in the city. And that's both on the city administrator and the mayor. So that the city administrator suddenly resigned raises questions not about pressure, not about crises that befall all of us if we're in service positions for any length of time. The question is what has been enabled by the current mayor and some council members over the years that have resulted in the toxic environment the unproductive and burdensome environment for those who are just trying to do business in the city. And the morale among many employees, as they have privately shared with me, is at an all time low. Uh, so in the recruitment, let's talk about number one urgent step that I've not seen at council yet. Uh, close sessions to identify an interim contract, yes, contract, not current employee, contract, city administrator. Because what happens, Jerry, in executive search recruitments, when a current employee gets slotted in as interim and a search goes out, there's a dampening effect in terms of any qualified outstanding applicants wanting to apply because it looks like that that interim has the inside track. So we need to be very careful. And while I look at the council agenda every single Tuesday, thus far, I've not seen uh, closed session items for this. And the council is going to go on a three week vacation starting what, August 24th? They come back, what, after the city administrator leaves? Where is the number one priority for what they need to face right now? I'm not seeing that sense of urgency. Yeah. James, I, I, I mean, you're running for mayor, and I just want to take it back to that for a second. And in the charter, you know, the mayor doesn't have a lot of powers, but it, you know, the big thing is uh, she runs the meeting and uh, with the administrator uh, sets the agenda. What would you, uh, how would you describe what you think would be the proper relationship uh, between the mayor and the council? Uh, you know, given uh, sec Section 607, the non-interference clause that you were 
the mayor really can't get into the telling people what to do. What, what does that relationship look like? Uh, thanks, Jerry. If, if, I, if I can, I, Deborah, I'm not sure, but I think that that recommendation to contract a, a city administrator would go against the, the state law. Uh, but, but you know, there may be some leniency in that somewhere. Um, to answer your, your, your question, Jerry, I think, you know, you, the, the proper relationship is the, the city, the city council and the mayor is to hold the, the city staff, primarily the city administrator, uh, accountable for their actions, right? And so having some accountability measures uh, in place in order to say, okay, what are some benchmarks for performance? What are some benchmarks that we want as a city? And how are you performing towards those benchmarks? And, and you know, I, I think that's, you know, a simple, you know, uh, um, you know, if we're going to use the, the CEO uh, analogy, like that's a simple CEO board relationship. Um, and, and, you know, I think that that's more the relationship that we need to head towards it and less um, uh, uh, reliance on. Um, yes, there's, there's a need for, for that institutional knowledge that's brought through, through an administrator and, and that, that administrative staff, uh, but, but less of a reliance on in setting the direction and really allowing uh, the elected body to, to, to set that tone uh, and, and, and set that direction through the city administrator on down. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry, we need we need to set we need to set something really straight right now. We have uh, a non former employee outside uh, leadership individual as our interim police chief. He was not an employee of the city. He will not be an employee of the city. He's um, a placeholder for a very important department and he's not under recruitment consideration. He'll be returning to retirement. We have Helen Benjamin at City College as an example of an interim contract a superintendent president while they conduct the second recruitment trying to fill that position. Yeah. So this is not this is not uncommon in public sector and I think it gives the city an important fresh start. Uh, because our uh, priorities are out of balance in so many ways, which we can also talk about on the show. Right, you know, Randy, if I, if I may, Randy, if Randy, I may interrupt there, though. Yeah, go ahead. Let, let, me, let, me just, let me just finish up. Let yeah. me follow up on what Deborah just said about the, the interim, though. Yeah. So we had an interim fire chief and Lee Waldron, who, did not, didn't, who actually put in for the position, was not chosen for the position. We had both Brian DeMoore and Joshua Hagmark as public works directors, they did not they did not rise to the to the position in terms of how they were chosen. So I don't think it's an automatic. And I do think that with Rebecca Bjork, who's basically been the utility man in this whole ball, and she's Rebecca played every Bjork position on the field. Ran the yes, public works as being the interim. Um, yeah, who is uh, I think just I, I I'm assuming that the council is going to appoint her as such. I guess that's that may be a big assumption. I'm not sure, but. What I'm saying is it's not cast in stone. I don't know that there's a particular advantage or disadvantage to being the uh, the interim. So I, I I would I would take issue with that with that uh, concept. All right, let me let me uh, just to back up a little bit. Uh, again, uh, the mayor was invited to be on, whether she wasn't able to uh, attend uh, because of a conflict, but she did send an email with some bullet points on what she think uh, thinks is important, and and I want to just. Uh, call out one because it goes to uh, Deborah, your point about uh, Barney Malekian, who's uh, serving as an interim police chief. Uh, she she says that the uh, the candidate should have experience or ability to oversee a police department and an appreciation of the changing nature of law enforcement. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, let me start. Let me just go around to Randy about that. Uh, the changing nature of law enforcement. How how important is that uh, in the sensibility and the uh, and the the uh, experience of uh, of a new uh, city administrator? Well, first of all, that comment is 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 true. Uh, but the uh, the unfortunate, the ironic part about that is is when uh, our council was challenged by uh, BLM and eventually Healing Justice on those points. They never once stood up for the chief that we had on, on site and the reforms that she made towards the community policing that she'd done. About four of the items on the checklist were already being taken care of. We were a model example of that. So yes, 
The new administrator should recognize and appreciate that. And they should be looking for a police chief who recognizes and, believe, and, and appreciates that dynamic. Um, and Barney, who's been around forever, appreciates and understands that dynamic and is fully supportive of it. So I agree with that, but I think it's, it's unfortunate that uh, we're talking about having the new administrator being one to implement that when our, our people that are on the ground right now are already doing precisely that in our, in our agency. Hey, Deborah, let me, uh, the, the, the administrators, the new person's for probably biggest first job will be finding a, finding a permanent a police chief. Um, do you think that the council per se uh, should have more of a say about certain department heads? The, the, the charter is pretty clear uh, on this point, but uh, I've gotten a sense from when you and I have spoken that you feel like the mayor and the, and the council ought to step up a little bit more on this. Uh, well, well, the city charter does need to be revisited. I've mentioned this on a number of occasions, uh, but let's go to the heart of the matter. Uh, I think that without the seven electeds getting along more respectfully and effectively, it's really difficult, if not impossible, for them to give some consensus direction to the city administrator or the city attorney. Again, it comes back to the leadership of the mayor. Now, uh, with a recruitment- Do you think using, so you, 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 the mayor has not done that is what you're saying? Uh, the current mayor has definitely not done that. So now with recruitments, um, I think that there should be, a, as a part of the process, a point at which the seven electeds are able to interview and evaluate the top candidates. Uh, I can't presume to know if that ever did occur or consistently, I've been told otherwise. Uh, that's not to say that they select the candidate. Uh, we, they can't under the current city charter, but they need to have more awareness before a single employee, that's the city administrator, selects a department head, especially at these critical crossroads, whether it's the police uh, chief or any other department head. And we just have a new community development director who I've been in communications with from out of state, New Mexico. Uh, and so you see all these department turnovers. Um, some, of, some of it sure is um, due to retirement, but others have to do with the toxic work environment, that culture matters, that it hasn't been uh, supported and nurtured and that we are at odds with the community. We have both the city administrator and a current mayor that both of them are not bridge builders. That's been a part of this mayoral race conversation. So we need the intelligent, we need the experience, we need a temperament. I've been talking about some things that Randy has now mentioned in the media. So I guess imitation is the uh, best form of flattery. Thank you, thank you, Randy. Um, so we need, all, we need all of that in the next mayor and that's, that, yes, it ties to recruitment, uh, but, but it's part of our city that's out of balance uh, in so many ways. All right, and James, uh, two, two things. One, um, could you address the, the issue of the changing nature of law enforcement, the point that, <clears throat> that uh, Mayor Kathy Murillo has raised and, and how important or, or not, you know, kind of where do you put that on the priority scale uh, in terms of a, a new administrator and then, if you would uh, kind of build on uh, or, or take off on uh, Randy and uh, uh, Deborah's comments about uh, uh, culture and, and uh, the need, uh, how, how would the uh, administrator works uh, with the mayor? Sure, so um, as, as far as like the changing nature of, of policing, I mean, you know, we can call it that, but it, it, that I think is, is, is more simply just an understanding of your community um, and we definitely would need a city administrator who understands this community and, and, and this community is demanding uh, a, a change in, in the way things have been done. Now, a lot of that is driven by the national conversation. I, I absolutely recognize we have a, a great model police force here, but that does not mean that it is without a, a, a need for correction in areas, right? And so um, um, even, even the best of us can, can, can improve. 
Um, and so I think that if we are a model, I think that needs to be part of the culture that is part of our city uh, and, and part of part of our, our, our police uh, department. Um, you know, as been, has been pointed out on, on, on this show and others around town, Jerry, is, is the need for uh, diverse, uh, diverse representation uh, in, in city leadership. Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, with the most recent hires, we haven't necessarily seen that represented. Um, and, and I think that that, that that is something, you know, attracting diverse talent to our city uh, is something that, that, that as mayor, I would actively be, be a part of, to actively be assisting in, uh, in, in whatever capacity uh, uh, allowable. Uh, because I think that that is what kind of brings the best of us out. Now, does that mean always bringing in people again from outside? Not always, right? And sometimes that's just building up those that are here, but we've got great folks uh, and and we, we we all all of us as candidates and community members know them who who are born and raised here go off to to do great things and are looking for a reason to come back um, and, and so you know these are some of the things that we need to be be mindful of as, uh, as we continue to, to evolve forward as a city. Hey uh, Randy, uh, what what about that? that? You know, I, reading the charter sections about this, you know, I was just struck like everything says he he it doesn't say she, let alone you know, take into consideration binary people or people of color or, or anything like that. How important is it, is diversity uh, as a, as a uh, uh, I guess an aspiration, as a, as a goal in, in not only this hire, but other high profile hires. We just hired a, a public works director and a community development to uh, more uh, old, old white guys. I, I don't know how old they are, I take that back. Um, but uh, what, what do you think on that? I don't toss that old white guy thing around to easy there, Jerry. Come on, big guy. Um, <laughs> you know, it was funny. You guys commented on that after Paul hired those people. And we, you know, we have a, an African-American airport director. Almost all of our department heads happen to be women. Um, and frankly, you know, I, I, I don't know. To me, diversity is, uh, is, is more of a, you know, a, a complete menu of opportunity for all qualified candidates. And... I think sometimes it puts people in, a, in an unfair position if they, they're trying to check off a box versus uh, getting the right person. I actually was joking with Paul when he hired Lori and told me who he hired. I went, oh, oh, so you checked off a box. And he, he bristled and, uh, and he doesn't bristle very easily. So that was kind of fun doing that. But no, I think it's, I think it's important. I think it's important that the community um, uh, is reflected in our executives to the level possible. But you know, when it goes, I'm going back to Deborah's point about being involved in the hiring. You know, when I was in business for 38 plus years, I did a lot of hiring and firing, both executives and rank and file. And it's the hardest thing you do. And I made a bunch of mistakes over the years. I didn't have the help that the council will have when they hire the city administrator and the city attorney, which is going to be consultant advice as well as, uh, um, you know, a team to do it. And I wouldn't want to task them who are not necessarily experienced at personnel and hiring and firing in trying to decide who it's going to be. And going back to the thing about diversity doesn't necessarily have to be political, but if this council, I think, especially as it stands, would be extremely political in some of those influences and choices. So either you hire the executive that you want that can make those kind of decisions and hold those people accountable, or you, and, and where you don't. And I think that one choice needs to be focused on. I don't think we want to try to have a board of directors, which is not a board of directors, even there are the people that work for the board of directors, but this council be choosing and get into the weeds on each and every person. I think that would be a big mistake. And charter is actually, the way this charter is designed speaks to exactly that. All right, Deborah, you want to pick up on that? Uh, you've talked, uh, a couple of times about what uh, about charter reform. What do you think needs to be changed uh, uh, in you know that addresses this relationship between council administrator we've been talking about? Well, we probably need more time to talk about the city charter, Jerry, because it's very dense document, very legal document, and it will take um, a vote of the people to change it. There are changes that are needed and are feasible. Be long before the voters changed the city charter. Let's go to some of the quotes that the mayor has made to the media statement, and that's uh, predates what you've just received from her. Uh, tied to the city administrator's resignation, 
She encouraged him to not resign. I mean, she, she is his number one fan, I would say. And uh, she thinks the city is being run well. Uh, the city administrator thinks that we're coming out of the economic recovery well. Well, I would say part of a city out of balance is fiscal priorities. When we have a city administrator whose compensation package is more than the governor of California, and at the same time, our current mayor has voted to virtually decimate our library department, that is reduce the, reduce the uh, allocation by over $400,000 when she ran on a platform in 2017 of championing the reopening of the library on Mondays. Where are the values? Where's the community commitment? Uh, is, is it to bolster a city administrator compensation for fear that he'll resign? Well, he now has resigned. And where are our library, some of our most important resources not only during the summer, but all year round, safe, educational, nurturing environment for everyone in our community. So this just goes to, it. it's so far beyond the city charter in what needs to be created, what needs to be healed, uh, the bridge building with community, and I would say a restoral of confidence and trust. And we just don't have that in our current mayor. And I think the community has increasingly become well aware of that. Yeah. James, how about the salary <clears throat> question? Deborah uh, notes that uh, the city administrators paid more than the governor of California. Of course, city administrator, not an elected official. And, you know, that was one of the, the things in that LA Magazine story. But if, the best I can tell from transparent California, uh, his package is around $285,000, $290,000 uh, with bells and whistles. Um, uh, is that too much? Uh, or, or do you think uh, we'd be unable to attract a real quality a person uh, for for less than that? Well, Jerry, in, 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 in the, my thinking and the journalistic foundation of that is that, you know, compare that to, to like cities, right? And, and so how does that, that salary for a city administrator stack up to uh, other like-sized cities in, in California? Because, you know, we know, we know better than to, to try to compare it outside of California. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that it's, it's not too far uh, out of whack with that, but we also need to be considerate of, of what specific uh, challenges that we, we have here in, in Santa Barbara. Um, when you hear that, of course, there's sticker shock to 280, right? Uh, um, but when you, you look at, you know, I, I think as, as you, you've pointed out on the show as well, is that, um, you know, the, uh, a family of, of or excuse me, $70,000 is, is, is about the, the um, median income for, or the, for the poverty line is, is you know, in, for Santa Barbara based on the median income. Like that's just for one individual, 100,000 or so for uh, a family of four. And so, you know, when you look at, at 280 in, in Santa Barbara, it's, it's, it's about on, on par with what the cost of living is. Yeah, Randy, Jerry, but let's have Randy and then Deborah. Okay, in. so yeah, the conversation, James, James, Craig, Paul's salary falls in. We did a salary survey before we did his last salary adjustment was I was on council and it falls right within the meeting for that size of an agency. Once again, you've got a, you've got a, a you know, a full size city. And if you were to say, let's compare that to a private sector compensation, well, if you take the CEO of a $400 million corporation, I would dare say they probably be making a fair amount more than that amount of money. Yes, the governor is an elected position uh, and it is about $200,000 for his quote unquote base salary. I think his entire budget is just a little more than that for the governor's office, the mansion, the airplanes and whatnot. So, so I, I always uh, I always think that's kind Picking of- Picking up the tab know. at the French laundry, that's probably in there too. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul, Paul, you know, is more of one of those uh, go to Jill's for lunch kind of guys. So I don't know if that's uh, that's going to be a fair comparison, but it, it it's a lot of money compared to what people make in Santa Barbara. No question about it. It's, you know, but it is once again, it's not an elected position. It is a higher position. It's an executive position, one that's responsible for a myriad of departments. Uh, at the peak time of our headcount, the 1,500 person organization is down quite lower than that now, as well as an airport, uh, you know, uh, water treatment, water desal, and harbor. And uh, so a lot of bells and whistles for that. So I think this compensation is really not a, it's not an issue. Yeah, Deborah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Uh, so, Jerry, the city of Santa Monica, as far as I was recently reading, uh, has um, a placeholder still for their city manager, and it, they've been on a 14-month or so search to no avail. Uh, we, our city, with the media-covered challenges, crises, and scandals, is going to have a really difficult time finding the right kind of city administrator to replace the current city administrator. It is not just going to be about the compensation package. Yeah. It's also going to have to be about a reset, a bridge building with the community, uh, outreach to all seven electeds, respectful outreach and collaboration. Again, culture matters. So I raised the compensation issue because part of the out of balance situation is where we're taking money from departments like library and yet not asking for financial sacrifice. This goes back to the beginning of the pandemic. Do you remember the brouhaha around, first of all, the city administrator not stepping up voluntarily to offer a salary reduction and then it seems to me and others kind of begrudgingly agreeing to a very modest uh, cut. Yeah. So all of this gets wrapped around uh, leadership. We've talked about this. We'll continue to talk about this. But when we have a city to the south of us that can't find a city administrator replacement, and part of this, I think, is larger than just Santa Barbara or just Santa Monica. We can talk another time because I've been talking to major businesses in on the central coast and the challenge they're finding with senior level management hires. Things have changed out of the pandemic in terms of life priorities, professional priorities, quality of life priorities. Nobody's going to come in even at a six figure salary here unless the culture changes and they know they have the support of the seven member council, including the mayor, to change the culture from the inside out and heal the relationship with the community. That can't happen under the current mayor. Fortunately, with the resignation of the city administrator, we have some hope in that arena. James, do you, uh, I, I, I wanna raise this one more point. Uh, we'll, I, I think this will be the last issue. Um, and I'll be glad to give you all a a chance to just uh, say whatever you want at the end. But again, from the mayor's email, she says uh, uh, an important quality for the administrator is understanding the challenges that may arise from a district-based council, uh, which I would call the uh, understatement of the year. Um, uh, and Deborah's talked a lot about it. I think R Randy mentioned that, you know, we, we we're known as a dysfunctional municipality now, and Deborah's talked a lot about the toxic culture and so on. How much of that is due to the district board and what role do the mayor and the administrator have in addressing that? You know, I, I would, you know, put that less on the district, the structure of, of having district elections than as it is the, the mayor's lack of a capacity to understand how to manage that. Right, it's 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 understanding that you have representatives from each part of the city. Um, you may have heard me point out it's as simple as sitting down and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's not currently happening. Sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each individual council member to find out you know what's going on in their district and find out what needs to be done. Um, you know that's a simple approach that's currently not happening that 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 could help move our city forward. And that and and that's a simple simple conversations that our city city deserves. Uh, and, and that's a lot of what got me into this, finding out you know, what is currently happening in our city at, at the staff level, having worked for Senator Jackson for the past decade and, and really looking and seeing like a lot of things that aren't happening are just because people aren't talking to one another. And, and, and that's a skill set that, 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 I, that I bring to the table and really in convening those tough conversations, regardless of what, what they are about. Um, and so, you know, leaning head in to, you know, those, those, those tough things that we have to encounter are, are going to be what are going to allow us to prosper, you know, as we move forward. Yeah. Hey, Randy, so you've really, uh, I don't know how many mayors you, you uh, served with on council or how many administrators, but uh, I, would, I would assume the numbers 
in the hundreds, uh, given your uh, life experience. But um, talk a little bit about that relationship again between the mayor and the administrator, the council and the mayor. And, you know, how should that all work ideally? Well, ideally, you know, and, uh, and James kind of touched on it. I mean, you have these dist district representatives. And what's hard about this new fully districted council is they don't really understand their job. They're talking about their districts. But once you get to the dais, every decision you make, every subject, every agenda item is an at-large item. So what they really should be doing, as opposed to trying to say, I'm going to get this and this from my district, is just being out and listening in their district. And the mayor should be encouraging them to do that. She's the last uh, at-large person elected on that council. She should be helping to make this transition into what's been a really difficult, awkward period for, for local politics. And so what you have right now is, is you have a council that at least on, on the surface doesn't look like it really knows what it's doing or how to function with this new district kind of concept. It really should involve some, some gatherings, some retreats, some meetings to decide exactly how you want to relate to each other and bring forward cogent policy so that when you get a phone call from San Roque, but you're the West Side uh, district person, it's, it's the same thing. You should, you should never be isolated from other people in other districts because that's not how you govern. You govern at large. Yeah. Deborah, um, uh, la last word on this one to you. Uh, you know, I think Randy's right. You know, you're going to have applicants who look at the, just what's been going on for the last year, year and a half here and say, why would I want to come here? It is dysfunctional. Uh, what do you tell them, and 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 how do you uh, propose to uh, fix that? You want me to first comment on district elections? Sure. You, you give me a, you give me a chance to talk about that. Uh, so very briefly, Jerry, uh, I was skeptical to say the least. Um, although we didn't have a choice with threatened litigation to return after forty years to district elections. And I think it's sort of a, the good, the bad, and the ugly with district elections. On the one hand, on a positive note, we have uh, some council members from districts that um, understand uh, their district, uh, are connected to the districts, and uh, give voice and promote voice for those districts. I think that's important, even in a 90,000-person city. On the other hand, and there's been much discussed about this, uh, it can create these silos or kind of provincialism where uh, 4,000, 5,000 voting members are just are the only focus for a district elected council member. Um, so it falls to the mayor to help weave together all of these differing and sometimes competing interests among all of the districts throughout the city, but it comes back to relationships. And before um, we get to you know your other topic. I want to say that I recently completed a questionnaire for endorsement that um, will be vetted next month. And I was asked, what are my top two priorities, um, like day one of being elected or being sworn in? And as I thought about that, and this is why this is important to me, Jerry, the very first thing in policy, it's scheduling a professionally facilitated retreat among the seven electeds, because that relationship among the seven is the starting and stopping point for all of this. Uh, there was, I would say, probably um, an ineffective retreat that happened in recent years, uh, but this is not a common occurrence and it's long overdue. And I think until the seven can work well together and that's led by a new mayor, uh, everything else I think is gonna fall by the wayside. So you want me to touch on something else though, I think before you conclude. No, that's good. You can touch on it at the end. Um, you guys have been so, uh, you, you, you all have been so generous with, with your time. I think uh, we've accidentally lurched into the first uh, mayoral forum of the, of the yeah. campaign. Although Surprise. <laughs> Nice, nice going, Jerry. You pulled that one over on us. No, I, for the people, I, for the people. <laughs> uh, with one big exception, of course. Um, anyway, all right, uh, let's just go around uh, for, for a final word. Uh, James, uh, you know, the entry point to this conversation was the city administrator, you know, what qualities, what process, you know, what salary, all these kinds of things. But 
you know, take a step back. What's the broader issue? And, and just talk a little bit about why you're running for mayor. Well, I, I think the broader issue ties directly into why I'm running for mayor. And it's about, you know, the tone moving us forward, right? Right now, we have too much division uh, in our, our country and, and our community. Uh, and, and that needs to change. And, you know, that's something that, that requires, you know, sitting down with people who you may not necessarily agree with and, and, and talking through those differences and challenging challenges for the greater good. Um, that's something that I saw as a value uh, as a reporter, but couldn't do anything about it. Uh, that's something I saw as a value uh, as a staffer for, for you know, our state senator and our state assembly member, uh, and really bringing you know, members of, of the community regionally, our regional community, seeing what works throughout the region at, at the municipal level, uh, and, and seeing what doesn't work, and bringing that knowledge to you know, what we can can do in Santa Barbara to move us forward. And it's so it, it's really an amalgamation of all of that 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 knowledge and experience and exposure uh, to being able to be helpful for our city moving forward. Status quo is not gonna be what moves us forward. It's gonna be really taking some risk uh, and really uh, trying things uh, that are gonna, gonna put us on the edge and, and, and really uh, uh, let us shine the way that we as a city of Santa Barbara deserve to globally. All right, Randy, you wanna talk a little bit about why you're running and, and what you hope to do? Well, yeah, I wanna talk about that. And I wanna to touch briefly on what the original question was gonna be, what we expected to see in the city administrator. Um, but I think that, I think the current thing between the three of us here on the program is leadership. And I think that's where the void is. And I think that's what we wanna provide. And when it comes to leadership, it comes to how you communicate and work with the next city administrator and the next city attorney and the next department heads and all the above. But you want a city administrator that is gonna get a, uh, uh, have a, a culture of departmental uh, communication, somebody who also encourages a succession plan. So one thing that I've, uh, I was unhappy with it with the current situation was the succession plan, even within the administrative office. Been a weird year, been hard. We've had to leave some positions open and I get that because of budgets. But everybody from every department on down should be looking to how to replace themselves in a number of years by bringing up their subordinates to the level of competency that's required for the departments. So I think that encouraging that type of thing uh, was a pattern in the past. I think we may not make sure that this new person has that in space as well. Uh, in terms of doing the hires, uh, department hires, I don't really think the electeds should be a part of that necessarily. I do think that person should be, should have, there's a lot of community assets to leverage in terms of experience, executive experience, private and public sector experience to help do that interview and selection process when it comes down to the final candidates. We do use consultants in these search firms and they bring you X number of candidates, but I do think the diverse outside uh, community input for that as city administrator to leverage while they're making hires should be encouraged. And then uh, lastly, uh, I, what I call the ivory tower syndrome. Uh, we don't want someone, neither the council mayor nor the city administrator to be locked in the ivory tower of city hall. They should be out, they should be communicative, uh, not necessarily a full open door policy, but certainly approachable on all levels and with all departments to make sure that any kind of dysfunctionality is nipped in the bud and right now. We already have P3 standards to say, these are your performance standards that you need to meet. We have annual reviews for each and every one of those, including the city administrator, city attorney. But what we need is that culture of saying, we're going to get proactive about identifying problems and getting to them and not let them fester, not let rumor and innuendo go within the, within the community and of course within the organization and keep that keep that, um, uh, that ability to triage and to treat problems as they are before they're happening, before they get out and before they create the current culture we have. All right, Deborah, last word. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Jerry, for, for pulling this together. And I'm sorry that it's not all four of us. I think that speaks volumes uh, to the state of our city and uh, the current mayor. Uh, Santa Barbara is my hometown. It's a city I deeply love, and that's why I returned in 2005 for my business career in San Francisco. And we are at not just a challenging, but at a crisis point with three major issues, homelessness, housing shortage, and economic uncertainty. 
Um, my 11 and a half years on the City Planning Commission, I think, create a proven track record of my respectful engagement with my colleagues and now for uh, three different years as chair of the City Planning Commission. Here are my three C's. There's care, connection, and cooperation. We don't have these three C's in our current mayor without caring about the entire community. That is every neighborhood and every sector and every demographic. There cannot be the connection necessary to ultimately forge cooperation. So these concepts and terms of bridge building and conversation, all of that cannot happen without the three C's in place. I believe that I can bring that. And in my outreach to the community, I'm really pleased at the support uh, that I've been receiving and am hopeful to earn the voters' confidence uh, come November 2nd to be the next mayor. All right. Well, Deborah Schwartz and uh, James Joyce and Randy Rouse, thank you really so much. I mean, it was kind of an accidental thing. I mean, I, I, I don't sure. I, I, I really, you know what you're doing, Jerry. I really do appreciate you all coming in and, and you know, also, you know, having been in the business of covering campaigns for more than 40 years, I, I also know <laughs> what a delight it is to be a candidate. And, and there's good parts, but it's a lot of work and, and you have to take a lot of uh, a guff, I think, uh, from, from people who, and, and I just want to thank you. I guess what I'm saying is thank you for running and, and putting yourselves out there. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's early. There's only 98 days till the election. Uh, so maybe not that early, but uh, I hope we can do this again. Uh, it was good, I thought, to really focus on one particular issue, at least for most of the time. And, and uh, I appreciate you, you doing it. And I, I hope the experience will uh, um, encourage you to, to come back and, and we, we can take on some of these other issues. So uh, thanks Randy. so much, Randy. And good to see you, James and Randy. Thanks so okay. much. Thank you. And I, Thank as you. I would say to any mayor, I go, come on, Jerry, stick to the agenda, will you? <laughs> All right. And with that note, <laughs> thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on News. All right, very good. Cheers, Thank everyone. you. Bye. Bye.